Good morning. Friends, the Lord be with you. Grace and peace to all of you in the name of Jesus Christ as we gather on this first Sunday of Advent. We gather to wait and to watch for Christ's coming. It is indeed a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord and we are glad that you are here. We have just a few announcements this morning and we will begin worship. The first announcement I'll make is if you were here last week and you look around the sanctuary this week, you'll notice that some changes have been made. You'll notice that there are lots of lights. You'll notice that there's lots of greenery, and you'll notice that the place looks fantastic. Not that it didn't last week, but it looks fantastic in a way that Christmas brings out. Now, if it gives you some anxiety about decorating your own home and getting that stuff done, I'm sorry. I think it did in our household. We ended up decorating a lot this week. But we're done now too, and it is a wonderful thing to see. And so a special thank you to everyone that stayed after worship and ate lunch last week and uh, enjoyed, I think, we had a good time doing it. Uh, there were a lot of people here, and I understand it was sort of a, a high number of folks that stuck around to do it, um, that stuck around to decorate for uh, Christmas here in the sanctuary and outside uh, all around the building. Um, I am thrilled with the way it looks and I know everybody else uh, was too. So uh, thanks to everyone who came and participated and made sure that the place just looks wonderful and ready for Christmas. The first time I ever saw this sanctuary, it was still decorated uh, for Christmas. That wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. They snuck us in by cover of darkness and we got to see it with all the decorations. And it's wonderful to see the sanctuary put back uh, that way. So we've begun uh, Advent and you'll find, you probably heard announcements already, but Advent will continue. And next week you'll be getting in the Vine announcements about all of the various Christmas services that will be going on and the special things that will be happening uh, throughout this month. Uh, I do want to bring one uh, personnel matter to you just to let you know for sake of information. Many of you already know this, but some of you do not. Uh, earlier this week on Wednesday, uh, we received uh, Diane Pickens' resignation, and it was effective immediately. Uh, we are grateful to Diane for the work that she did here and uh, still stand in awe of her ability as a musician, and uh, she's made it uh, known to us that she'll be back to visit for worship from time to time. Uh, we had a pleasant conversation Wednesday morning, but uh, she's not with us, but Jean can, thankfully, and she said she feels like she's back at home. Jean can is back on the bench, as she says. It kind of, I kind of snicker when I hear her say that, but she's going to be playing for us uh, through Christmas, and uh, we'll be getting help. We are, we are very blessed in this congregation to have so many folks with musical talent who have been willing and offered uh, their willingness to uh, step up and pitch in and help us. So, uh, not to use a pun, but we will not miss a beat, and uh, we will um, we will joyfully worship God no matter what. Let's see if I have any other announcements that you need to know. Uh, today, uh, speaking of worshiping God, we will be. Uh, singing away in a manger for our middle hymn. I'm going to not ask the congregation to rise for that because while we're singing, our children will be decorating the uh, remainder of the Christmas tree. So we're going to sing and do that, but the reason we're not standing up is so that all of you in the back will be able to see what they're doing up in the front. And this has potentially unknown consequences because I've got at least one child participating in that, and there's no telling what might happen. We may redecorate completely this morning. I don't know. So just know that, that when it comes. And the final announcement that I'll make today is that we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. And uh, we are, just as we're blessed with so much musical talent in the congregation, we're blessed with some great cooking talent too. Uh, over the last several months for communion, we've been uh, wonderfully blessed to have uh, Lonnie Bixler's bread that we've used. Today we're not using that. We're using one of his loaves of bread to break, but we're going to be using the wafers that Carol Kennedy has made for us. Thank you so much, 
We've used them. You didn't have to frown. You're supposed to <laughs> smile and grin. I've been told the story about the wafers, and we're thrilled that they are back. The choir's been standing for quite a while now, so I need to be quiet and let them sing. Those are all of our announcements. <laughs>
friends, join with me in our call to worship as it is found in our bulletin and, as resp and is responsive. Friends, this is the season of holy waiting. We wait for the one who will tear open the heavens and come down to save us. We watch for the day when God's name will be made known among the nations. Friends, even as we do walk in the light of God, we are called to obey and we are called to confess. We know that if we say that we are without sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So let us before God and neighbor confess our sins, knowing that we come before a God that is just and righteous and loves us still. Lord, have mercy on us. We are not ready for your coming. We live in sin as though there were no justice. We live in fear as though there were no grace. Forgive us, Lord. Show us your mercy and steadfast love. Lead us in your truth and teach us in your paths. For you are the God of our salvation. Amen. Friends, know that as we begin this season of waiting and watching, that we are indeed waiting and watching for our own redemption. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. you may be seated and if the children will come forward in just a moment and y'all get ready the children are going to come forward they're going to decorate the tree and in just a second we're going to sing the very first carol of the year
Friends, let us pray. Holy and loving God, open our hearts and our minds that we may hear your voice this day. May your spirit move in all of us and indeed move all of us to your work. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Friends, our epistle reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians. I'll be reading from the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 13. We are, most of us, familiar with 1 Corinthians 13. This is perhaps the least familiar part of the verse. Hear now God's word to us this day. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. The greatest of these is love. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Jeremiah. I'll be reading from the 33rd chapter, verses 14 through 16. Verses or chapters 30 through 33 in Jeremiah are uh, known amongst commentators as what's called the little book of comfort. Jeremiah prophesies against Israel warning of God's judgment, and even a little bit in this area does the same. Jeremiah does this from prison. And Jeremiah speaks of invaders at the gate. Things are bleak when Jeremiah does this, and we'll talk more about it. But hear now God's word to us this day. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Advent begins with hope. And in the Christian calendar... We start the year off with Advent, so the first Sunday of Advent is the first Sunday of the Christian year. It beats the new year on January 1st by usually about a month and change, depending on how things uh, shake out during a particular uh, year, but a little short of a month this year. We start our year with hope. We as Christians profess that if we're going to begin something, begin a new year, get started on something new, that we do that with hope. And that sounds really, really good. But it can be kind of a tricky proposition sometimes. We, uh, this morning, lit the candle of hope. It's the very first one. But this is a big sanctuary. It's a vast room and it's just one candle, one small candle of hope. 
and we have lights to keep things going, artificial lights. We have a few other candles too, but it's just one candle, the candle of hope that we get the whole year started off with. A little spark, a little flame. Maybe, though, it's enough. Maybe this little candle at the very front surrounded by the other candles that are waiting to be ignited, maybe hope is exactly the one we need to start the year off. Maybe it's enough to get us going. Jeremiah, as I mentioned just a moment before, Jeremiah is bringing hope to Israel in the midst of terrible times. Jeremiah himself is in jail, kind of a house arrest. They'd sort of bunkered down because there were invaders at the gate. And even in what's called the little book of comfort, Jeremiah speaks about Chaldeans at the gates that will attack and ransack the city. He speaks of many who will perish. Basically what Jeremiah is saying is, folks, it may get worse. In fact, it will get worse before it gets better around here. But then Jeremiah says, don't lose heart. Jeremiah says, there is hope even in this terrible seeming time. In verses before where we began, in verses 7 through 9, just a few verses earlier, Jeremiah says that the Lord says, I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel. I'll rebuild them just as they were at first. God says he will cleanse from everyone their guilt and their sin. He says that Jerusalem will be a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth, and that everyone will hear the good that is done in this place. So much good that it will cause people to tremble with joy. Then we come to our passage today where the Lord talks about fulfilling the promises that have been made all through the generations. Where the verse talks about a righteous branch coming from Jesse. Y'all remember Jesse, right? We talked about him a few weeks ago. Jesse who had a son named David, Jesse, who was a forebearer of Jesus Christ. The passage goes on to talk about Jerusalem that now sees so much fear and danger at the gates that Jerusalem will live forever in safety. This was what Jeremiah prophesied in the midst of terrible, awful times. And it must, to the people who heard it, even as Jeremiah heard these words of God, it must have seemed like too much to even hope for. So maybe it's worthwhile to talk a little bit about what hope really means. So I'll ask, and and don't raise your hands. We're good Presbyterians. We're not going to do that. But I'll ask, and, and just sort of nod if this is... Has anybody ever heard the phrase, don't get your hopes up? Don't get your hopes up. I tell it to my kids all the time. Don't get your hopes up. We don't want to promise more than we can fulfill. Don't get your hopes up because you don't want to get an idea that things are going to get better or that something good is going to happen and then have it dashed when it doesn't come to fruition. That's an interesting thing that we say about hope. Don't get your hopes up. In our epistle reading this morning, we read from Paul, and Paul talks about faith, hope, and love. Now, you can be forgiven if you heard me say 1 Corinthians 13 and you immediately thought about love. It's it's all about love. It's okay. We're going to talk about why that is in a second. Faith and hope sort of play a little bit in the background on that. But it caused me to think, no one ever says, don't get your faith up. 
or anything like that. That's an awkward statement. Don't get your love up. That's also an awkward statement. But nobody ever says, don't love too much. No one ever says, don't have too much faith. It could be dashed. I've never heard anyone say anything like that. More often, we are encouraging people to love more. We're encouraging people to have more faith. And yet, hope sort of gets left to the side. But don't get your hopes up. You know, I I read this from Paul. Faith, hope, and love. And on this day where we begin the church's calendar, on this first Sunday of Advent, on this day where we talk about hope, I look at those three that abide, and it hits me. Hope is the middle child. Hope is right there in the middle of everything. And you think, oh, Mike's going to talk about how hope is central to everything. Hope is the perfect thing. No, hope is the middle child. And if you, if you know a little bit about middle children, sometimes that can be a challenge. You see, I study family systems a little bit. I'm I'm not good at it. I hope to be good at it one day, but I study that a little bit. And one of the things we talk about a lot is birth order. And since I have three children, Jennifer and I have three children, we see that being lived out in front of us. So in, in the birth order of Paul's epistle, we have faith, hope, and love. And they kind of fit with what birth order theory says. Now, birth order theory is one of those things that says if you have a firstborn, Firstborns are fantastic. All your children are fantastic, but firstborns are fantastic. They're a little bit on the perfect side. They try to live into that. Now, some of you may recognize some of these things. Some of you may not. Perhaps they're a little too perfect. Perhaps they take on everything, and and faith kind of fits with that. Faith is this perfect thing that we're always seeking that's kind of elusive, It would be perfect if we had enough faith to do everything that we set out to do, but it seems like we can never quite get there. Faith, like those firstborn children, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Faith surprises us at every turn with the things that it does for us, that it makes us able to do with the joy that it gives us. But faith always wants a little more and that's okay for faith because faith can always do a little more and like our firstborn some of you've run into them they bring us great joy and they do great things but they might be a little bit on the perfectionist side and they may say well I could do a little more I could do a little more in this place and that's okay Let's talk about our thirdborn. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about Paul's thirdborn in the family of graces here. Love. Now they say in birth order theory that if you have three children and you have a thirdborn, the thirdborn will be all over the place. The thirdborn will be the life of the party. So as you can imagine that as I read this and I started thinking about it, I thought, yeah, that kind of fits with love. Thirdborn always has a big smile on their face. Thirdborn makes everybody happy. The thirdborn has a hug for everybody when they need it. I'm thinking I may be living this. I have a thirdborn that's just like that. The thirdborn is large and in charge and is almost like mercury. It's everywhere. And that's what Paul is really getting at in 1 Corinthians 13, love is like that. Love gets into all the crevices. Love gets in and fills all those places and lifts us up and makes us happy and makes us able to do things for people that we never thought we could do and to be in presence with people that we never thought we could pull off. Love just does that. It's the the elixir that makes everything possible. So for all of us that have had thirdborns or babies of the family, whether they're thirdborns or not, the babies of the family seem to make everything work out, just like love has a way of doing. But hope, 
Hope we sometimes forget about as we read Paul's words. Hope we sometimes forget about because we have a hard time figuring it out. And sometimes, and I say this with a kind of an apology to middle children everywhere, sometimes the middle children get forgotten. Not forgotten, really, but sometimes you're so focused on what the perfect firstborn is doing and you're trying to keep up with what the thirdborn is doing and where they're going and what they're doing because you never know, there's no predictability about it, that the middle one just gets kind of lost in the mix. It can happen. They don't mind telling you about it. But here's the thing about middle kids, and here's the thing where I think hope kind of fits in in that mold too. Hope is kind of Paul's middle child. You see, hope is the glue that holds us all together. Hope is the one that makes you know that your family is really a family. Hope is the one that gives you a quiet reassurance of the way things are going. Not bouncing all over the walls, not worried about what is next, but just looking at things and seeing that something interesting or exciting may be possible. We're nothing as a family, we're nothing as a people of God without hope. You see, hope, hope comes to us a little differently. Hope comes from the inside. Hope comes from our eyes. Or hope comes not from our eyes, but from our heart. It's, it's hard to describe. When I say that I'm really hopeful it's for something, it's not because I turned on the TV, which is easy to do this time of year, and I saw the, uh, I saw the ad on TV for the neat new thing that Apple is producing the neat new phone that I can have that'll do all kinds of nifty tricks or the ads that the malls put out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hope doesn't come from our eyes. Hope is this, this feeling that's hard to describe that comes from deep inside of us that maybe Maybe there's something more to what we can see. Maybe there's something more than what we can perceive is going on. Hope is the glue that binds it all together. I did something this week. I bought Jennifer a magazine for her because I knew she would want it. It's uh, Chip and jo Joanna Gaines. Y'all probably heard of them. They do the Fixer Upper show on uh, HGTV, and they do all kinds of neat stuff, and they've branched out now. I think they're going to, I think the show is, has, has moved on to a different phase of syndication or whatever, and now they're going to do a bunch of other things. And one of the things they've done is they've started a magazine. And I saw that, and I thought Jennifer would really enjoy it. So I... I bought Jennifer that magazine, and so as things usually go, you buy somebody a magazine or something, and then before you let them read it, you go and read the articles yourself. You steal it. Or at least I do. Sometimes. And so I did that. I thought it was interesting, too. And uh, So now, Jennifer, you'll get your gift when I get done with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's kind of a gift, right? Anyway... So I bought this magazine, and it's the Christmas issue, and they're doing all kinds of cool stuff, and they have all kinds of ideas. And uh, some of you may know, they're a very uh, spiritually oriented folks. They make no bones about that. And uh, Chip writes this article in the magazine, and I don't know what it'll be because I think this was the first edition of it, but he wrote this article talking about what hope really was for him. He talked about how his family was uh, kind of a, a simple middle-class family. They weren't rich, they weren't poor, uh, but that at the beginning of every Christmas season, his dad would go to the family room where, they, uh, where all the presents would be, and his dad would take butcher paper and put it over the door to the family room and draw like a picture on it and would block off that room for the kids to get into. 
must have been awful, I thought. How terrible as a child to know that their gifts resided just beyond that piece of butcher paper. There they were. They were waiting for you. And he talked about that as not being a bad thing, but something of anticipation. There was no way to know what was in that room. But their imaginations began to well up. They started to feel that feeling I was talking about inside, the thing that you can't really describe. The, uh, he said that, you know, at first you thought, well, maybe it's a bicycle. And, well, and then a week later, the bicycle turns into a moped. And by the time they get done with that, it turns into a fully automated car that kids drive around. He said our imaginations ran wild. We couldn't see what was on the other side of that door. but the hope was welling up in us. Now, he mentioned that they were a middle-class family. He said things never ended up as wild as some of their hopes had gotten, but they didn't feel like they had been dashed. They didn't feel like they had been wrecked. They felt at the end of when when the time finally came and they could tear through the butcher paper and see what was on the other side, they were never not satisfied or overjoyed by the gifts that were waiting for them. We know that feeling as children. Those gifts that were wrapped up and put in a place where we could see that they were coming, but we couldn't see exactly what they were. And that, I think, is in large part where Christian hope resides. Jeremiah talks about God fulfilling God's promises. What we've learned in the course of our life is that when God moves in our lives, God moves in ways that we might never have imagined God moving before. And we look with amazement and say, wow, I wouldn't have planned that, but isn't it amazing the way it worked out? Wow, I thought it might have been a moped on the other side of the the butcher paper, but I was thrilled with the hula hoop I got instead. You see, the gifts that God promises are indeed fantastic gifts, gifts that will not put our faith to shame, that will not put our hope to shame either. You see, the veil and the butcher paper that we stand up against is one of eternity, And we can't fully imagine and describe what's on the other side, but we come to this Advent season putting our hopes in a God who came to live with us. And with a God who will do that, the full realization of the gifts God has on the other side for us is truly beyond anything that we can imagine. But indeed, it is wonderful. So on this Sunday, we light one small candle of hope, maybe to remind us to let that feeling of hope that Christ offers us, that the coming of the Christ child offers us, to begin to well up inside, to work and play nicely with sister faith and brother love. We look at the small candle and we realize hope, the glue that holds us all together, doesn't need a lot of fanfare. It's enough. And thanks be to God that we start the year off with hope. Indeed, as Christians, may we start everything off with hope. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen.
Friends, let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity to offer these gifts. May they go to work in this place and places even beyond our imagination to do your work and to build your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.